All righty. Welcome everyone who's here. Um, this is the very first experimental um, open source call where we're focusing on different aspects of open source um, and looking forward to very much to feedback on this since we've not run this before in the cohort. Um, so today we'll be talking about things like code style, testing, code review and package management. Um, and I'm just going to run through a few of our usual housekeeping items before I before we kick off the actual talking. Uh, so first of all, uh, welcome. Open Life Science has a code of conduct. We remind at the start of every call to make sure that people understand that this is an important part of our behavior, that generally we treat one another with the respect that we would like to receive. Um, if you're using the Etherpad for this week's call, the code of conduct is right now on line 61. There's a link to it. I have, of course, just accidentally clicked on it and opened it and lost my Etherpad. OK, it's back. Um, so there is always more to the code of conduct than just be nice because uh, being nice is complicated. <laughs> so please do take a minute or two to actually check that out if you haven't before um, or as a reminder if you haven't recently. Um, if you do experience anything or witness anything that you believe isn't in line with the code of conduct, you can report that to the team email address, team at openlifesci.org, which reaches myself, Patricia, Berenice, Malvika, Emmy, and Paz. Um, if you don't want to reach that many people when you're reporting something sensitive, you can actually just email any individual one of us. Um, so th those email addresses are all on line 64 of the Etherpad. Um, and it's basically just first name at openlifesci.org. Um, we have Otter AI, which is on the top left corner of my Zoom on my desktop. And if I click on that, I can actually see a live transcript that's recorded by AI that allows you to follow along what's being spoken with varying degrees of success in a text format. Um, because Otter AI doesn't work in breakout rooms, we have two different ways that breakout rooms can actually work. We, um, we offer spoken breakout rooms, like the way I'm speaking now, or if you would prefer, you can also participate in a breakout room using a written format where you type into the chat or into the etherpad to communicate instead. Um, so we ask people to always change the start of your name to either W for written or S for spoken. And that way it's easy for us to quickly sort you into the correct rooms when the breakout rooms arrive. Um, in order to do that, and I'm going to do this now on my own name, I'm going to put myself as a spoken participant. I click on the participants list and beside my name, I click on the blue more button. I click rename and then in front I put S for spoken. And now whoever sorts me into a breakout room can put me into this spoken breakout room without having to ask me what I prefer. Um, I think that is just about all from the housekeeping. Um, if you've just arrived and you'd like to add anything to the icebreaker questions where we're asking where you could visit, where it might be in the world, please do share. There's lots of lovely, uh, lovely uh, sharing uh, things there already. And I am vicariously just imagining myself in bed, cozy and sleepy, or in a Lego vault, or many other amazing things that you've all shared. So thank you for that. Um, okay, looking at the next section, Kevin, are you happy to introduce Gemma for the next part of this talk? Unmute first. Still mute, still mute it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Yeah, so, our first speaker today is uh, is going to talk about code and style, code style and testing. Is uh, Gemma Turon. So, Gemma, taking off from here, introduce yourself and then give us your presentation. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, everyone. So let me share my screen. I'll put the link to the slides after the talk. I know I, I haven't done it. So I'll be looking sideways because my other screen is here. But can you all see my presentation? OK, perfect. So hello, everyone. I'm Gemma. And just as a disclaimer, or hopefully maybe also words of encouragement, I wanted to start my presentation just by introducing a bit more about myself. So my background is actually as a molecular biologist, completely wet lab. So this is 
how I spent many years of my life. Uh, so during that time, if you show to me anything like this, that would be my reaction. So completely scared of anything having to do with black co with code, black screens, uh, white letters. Um, that was really not my strong point. So how did I get from here to hopefully what I'm doing now, which would look more like this, which is implementing AI tools in experimental pipelines, mostly for infectious diseases and drug discovery in low resource settings. Well, I'm a self-taught programmer, mostly in Python. So I will be talking about Python mostly today. And I also started doing machine learning with the support, of course, of, of great teammates. I couldn't do all this alone. But this is just to, to say many of you maybe are more expert than I am in the audience or may, many of you are in the same position I was a few years ago, where you're just wanting to start your journey into programming. So I would just like to encourage you to just try it out and don't, don't be afraid of it because it's actually quite fun. <laughs> With that, um, let's go into a bit of today's topic, which is about code style and testing. So I couldn't, I, I just modified the presentation to include this slide, which popped up on my Twitter. This uh, review paper from earlier this year, which analyzed uh, this Harvard Dataverse, which is where Harvard researchers deposit their code, apparently. I, I didn't know about this database. But basically, the results they found were quite shocking. 74% of the files, they only focused on R files, failed to complete. And when the code, when the code was clean, only 50% or only 50% failed. So there is really a need for the code to be well styled, properly tested and reviewed uh, so that actually research code can be reused, um, especially important if, if we want to work on open source where many different contributors will bring in their ideas and, and their code. So what is code style? Well, basically the basic idea is you can, uh, so all the examples will be in Python, but I think this is translatable to many languages. You can actually achieve the same with um with different with different ways of writing it so in this case um these these statements and these statements would actually give the same output which is just printing my name is Gemma in in the screen but as you can see they are written differently so the question now is which is more correct what should i prioritize what i shouldn't do this is a very um easy and maybe stupid example but that's basically the bottom of it so code the style is a set of guides that help you write your code so it is understandable but by anyone that is easier to co-develop with other people and it avoids errors because if we all use the same style it, it is much easier for me to review your code um, for other people to review what they have done to contribute new code in the exact same style and i think this is essential for open source where many different people will contribute code so for today we'll just I just wanted to give you an applied example using Python and a bit of the review of, of what are the Python code styles. And then of course, what can we um, use? So some automated tools um, around code styling and testing, and then we'll dive a bit deeper into what is code testing. But let's start by, by code style. Um, so I just looked for a sentence that I was quite puzzled with when I started my journey into programming which is people always said, oh, this is more Pythonic, this is less Pythonic. I always, I couldn't really understand what do you mean by Pythonic? Well, so if you go into Stack Overflow or any other of these um, of these webs that provide um, help and support for programmers, uh, you'll see this a lot. Uh, which, which way is more Pythonic? So you have two ways of achieving the same again. You have a list which contains three numbers, one, two, and three. And you are basically asking the program whether four is in this list or not, which we can all guess the answer, it's not. Uh, so if not four in A, so if four is not in A, which can also be written in Python and both are correct, they won't give you a wrong answer. If four not in A, right? So we can write these statements in different manners. So which is, when people refer to which is the more Pythonic manner, they actually refer what is the best uh, manner to write it according to Python's style. 
So if we look at the answers for this particular question into stack overflow, actually what we see is this, they are identical, but the code style in Python, which is named PAP8, prefers the not in. So that then you should actually use the second option, which is if X is not in or instead of the other one. So that's just an example of things that you will find out there when you start working on, on your code and looking more into deep detail into code styling. Um, but basically, um, the goals, especially in Python, this is the um, the code style um, that is that is the base of Python, which is basically um, do things simple, do things nicely, do things explicit, so that everyone can actually read. I really like um, readability counts because uh, sometimes you write code that is very very difficult to follow. So making it readable, thinking how is someone else gonna read my code is really important for um, for developers. And I think this is also someone, something that should be surfaced, which is in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. So always try not leave the choice to interpret your code to other developers or to other users. Try to make it so explicit that they don't need to guess avoid guessing because it usually leads to errors. And so based on these very nicely um, written uh, guides, they actually develop what is called the PAP8, which is, I would say, the day-to-day -day Python formatting guide. And it has things, for those of you that know a bit of Python, this will be familiar. For those of you that do not use Python, this may not be so understandable, but it's basically a lot of little details that uh, matter when you write in Python. So for example, when you're importing packaging, I know we'll hear a bit more about packages later on, but basically, um, okay, there is a typo that's the start, that, that's missing an L, but you should not import packages just separated by a comma, but you should import each package separately. If you do that, both of them will be imported still, so it's just a styling thing, it's not wrong, but you should write them like this, or, for example, you should not write sentences that are longer than 79 characters. So instead of writing this, you should actually separate it nicely like that. So PAP8 con PAP contains all these different um, uh, norms. So my face, when I discovered all these, when I was starting my programming journey again, was like, what? How am I going to learn all these? It's not about only learning a new programming language, but learning about all these rules, like that's next to impossible, but don't panic. There are things that uh, out there to help us. So there is, for example, a tool called PI Lint from uh, Lint is Lintern. I'm not sure, but basically, uh, what it does is it checks your code for the style. So in this case, if I just take this very easy statement, which looks fine to me, right? So this is gonna print "Hello World," and then I take. Um, file in, so I install it and I run it on my test file, which, which just contains this. This is what I will get. So it's telling me what are the errors. So according, this is the reference to the PAP8 guidelines. And it says there is no space allowed after bracket. So this space should be removed. And sorry, this should be say before bracket because this space should be removed as well. And it's indicating you where is the error. Right, so this is actually quite helpful. It can really accelerate you first writing correct code and second learning about it because it's actually telling you what are the errors. So you can quickly start learning more about this kind of styles. And there are other things. So there are a lot of other um, similar tools to Pylon, um, but I also wanted to highlight um, tools that are more general so uh, that you don't have to go line by line. So for example, there is um, a, a package called Black, which basically allows you um, to block the entire repository. So it's gonna automatically check for some soft um, requirements according to Python code style and apply them throughout your GitHub repository. 
So we do this quite frequently. This is a snapshot of our of commits to one of Vercilia's open source code. Um, and you can see here actually um, just this commit, which just has black and code. This means that we just ran the whole black on all the code to make sure that these minimum requirements are met. And we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to review it. It's done automatically. Yes, yeah, so these kind of tools are quite, are quite useful. Um, so just some learnings or takeaway messages. Code style guidelines are important, are as important as the code itself, I would say. You should specify your preferred code style, which guidelines are you are daring to in your readme files, in your GitHub repo, so that everyone knows when they jump into a new project, what code guidelines they should follow. And it, it's really helpful for new contributors if you can uh, make um, guide them on, on what is the style that you're using and how to actually apply it. Um, this was only in Python, but of course, there are many other programming languages. As a general go-to resource, I would suggest um, to check out Google because Google codes in so many different languages. They have very good style guides for all of them. So if you go to this link, which I'll drop in the in the Etherpad later on, you can just find all these different code style um, for languages. And I think that's a, a nice start. Mm, OK, so before we finish, um, let's jump on quickly into code testing, which is not exactly the same as code styling, right? So code testing refers to basically re revising your code to identify bugs, as, as you can imagine by the name of it. Um, so we'll talk a bit about what are the different levels that, and depths of code testing that you can do, and then some automated tools for checking code, pair programming, and, and some yeah automated tools. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. So about code testing, there is basically two types of code testing. It could be static, which is basically proof reading. So you read through your code and you try to identify mistakes, or it can be dynamic. So basically, you take your code and you run it, and you just see if there are uh, if the program cannot run. There means there is a bug, and then you need to go back and, and try to, to fix it. And it can also be classified. Some people classify it as white or black testing. So white box te texting means that you check each unit. So for example, a function in Python or a module in Python, a class in Python, and just check that this works. So you just check that this function is actually well written. It doesn't contain errors. When you do a black box, te black box testing, you actually check the whole, um, the whole script without going into the source code. So you just give the out input and, and expect an output. Um, and everything that happens inside should be happening. If this doesn't happen, it means that there is an error in the, your code. And then you may need to go inside and do white box text, but white box text testing. So that's why they are named white and black because white, you can see it. You're really looking at the code. Black, you are just looking at the output. Okay, so again, um, sorry, let me explain before we go. Uh, there is the first functionality that I wanted to show. I don't know in which programs you are developing your code. I particularly like Visual Studio Code, and most of them have automated autocorrectors. So you can think of it the same way you think uh, in a Google Docs or in a Word document where it actually tells you the wrong misspelling. So I just wrote this example yesterday. I just recorded my screen for simplicity, but here I'm just defining a list of numbers. So that's one, two, three. You can see how it already puts on red if, if it thinks it's I'm not doing something correctly. So it can be annoying. Uh, but once you get used to it, it's quite convenient because here I'm going to iterate yeah, over my list to print each one of the numbers. So uh, I'm very happy with this. I run my code. Um, and what happens? is that I get an error. Yes, so there is a syntax error because in Python, here I would need to put two dots, yeah? So actually you can already see that I should have seen that before running the cell because there is a small red under a script here that is telling me there is a mistake here the same way there is a misspelling. It's letting me know you should um, check this before running. This is, of course, very simple. It's only one line of code, so I can run it 
see where there is the error and go back and correct it. But if you are writing code without running it, for example, you write 20 lines, it can really become burdening, right? So this kind of auto spelling or auto corrector tools are really helpful. So basically I see that there is this error. Of course I correct it because I know the syntax of Python. I run it and I get my output, which is each number printed. The second uh, useful thing um, to do for code testing is actually pair programming. Pair programming refers to sitting together with someone and developing code. So there is one, pe one person that is coding um, and the other person who is just supervising the code and guiding the whole direction of, of the code. So, um, so that it really stays aligned with like the end function or so the person just needs to focus on the actual functions that are being written and the other person is supervising. Um, this can be really fun. It can be complicated at the beginning. So it's something that you need to get used to. It's not only for teaching. So it's not um, meant only as a teaching way. It's also meant for really developers to actually speed up the way they write code and make sure they are not making mistakes. Of course, sitting together, especially now um, post pandemics is becoming more and more challenging because people don't share offices or you may work with people across the world. So there are some nice tools that you can use. Um, most of the um, Visual Studio or Atom or other um, code editors, they have already their own solutions um, for sharing the screen and doing this kind of pair programming. So if this is something that sounds like fun and interesting, I would really encourage you to try it out um, and, and just uh, see if you can actually improve your code by, by using this, these strategies of, of writing it together with someone. And then the final thing that I wanted to highlight is there are, again, the same way that for code styling, that there are fully automated ways of, of styling your code. There are fully automated ways of testing your code. In this case, because I know many of you probably use GitHub, um, in case of you, you are not aware, GitHub Actions allows you for continuous integration, meaning that every time that you push code, there is a test triggered in your GitHub repository. And if the test is not passed, you won't be able to make the merge of this new commit. So how does it look like? Um, these are the commits in our repository. And you can see how uh, we have set up this GitHub action where basically um, a one of our tests is falling. So that's why it has a red cross. So it's warning me you should not merge this commit because if you merge it, your code won't be able to run. There will be a mistake. Um, so if this is not enough, if you're still hesitant about the quality of your code, about how you're writing it, about how you can test it, um, just ask friends, ask other developers, for example, interns or people that wants to collaborate in your organization to run your code in different systems, in, in different environments to make sure that it's consistent and that it works. And I'm just highlighting this um, because we really, at Ercilia, we have really, really um, had a lot of support from, for example, Outreachy when we have new contributors to our code. I think this is just a testimony of how many issues we have open in our repository after the um, outreach contribution period, because there is all these new interns trying to contribute code and identifying all the things that we have not been able to test. So these are really, really, really useful. And, and, and you to encourage this kind of testing by third people, by other open source developers. And so um, it's really nice if you have easy to follow guides so that people can find an error and be able to then open an issue in GitHub and tell you this is the error that I had when testing your code in this manner, et cetera, et cetera. So that then you can actually debug it. Otherwise it becomes quite difficult. Um, but I think I've talked a lot and a lot of concepts just compressed into 10 minutes. I try to give some applied examples to make it easier to follow. But basically um, the take home messages is select a code style that you are using write guidelines or refer to written guidelines of how to follow this code style. Leverage automated tools as much as possible to make sure that this doesn't become a big burden for the developers. And just don't hesitate to ask for friendly reviews and support when you are developing your code. So I think that's it. Um, 
that's like my institution's contact, but uh, I also drop my email in the, in the etherpad so that you can contact me. And yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Gamma. Thank you for the exciting presentation. Now, the floor is open for questioning. Eh? Anyone who has a question for Gamma, you can either raise your hand or send it as a, as a chat. So you go to the reaction panel and click on raise hand button and then it will give you a chance to ask any question. There is one in the chat from Dario. Um, Gemma, should uh, the tester person be different from the programmer? Uh, no and yes. So you should always test your own code. But what I often encounter, if it's like a syntax error, you'll easily spot it. Um, if it's um, the what becomes more difficult to test is when you have a full code that needs to run in a particular environment because you always run it in the same environment, you know you have your packages installed and suddenly you pass this code onto someone else, they follow all the, all the instructions and then they cannot actually run anything, everything crashes. Um, so either you set up everything from zero again or you ask someone with a different system to test it again. So I would really advise to have someone else to also test your code if you really want to make sure it's working um, for different users. Anybody else? You can also write in the pad later on as well. And maybe Gemma, you can um, answer there as well. I tried sure. to write your answer, but it was too slow. So. Uh, yeah, Nikki is asking. Um, oh, sorry, you're muted. Go ahead, Nikki. Sure. Okay, so then maybe I have a question. So when you're working with, uh, let's say, a project that you want to uh, work with on, with collaborators on, right? So um, each person who comes to the project probably already has a style that they prefer, or a, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I assume there's a certain style that they prefer depending on the coding language, right? So when you have several people working on a project, how would you I mean, which would you say, okay, the standard from the language like PEP, for instance, would be what you adopt, or is it okay, then you tweak it for your own style? I mean, which would be preferred? Um, personally, I would try to come to an agreement with everyone and use one standard. So um, we ask to everyone that contributes code to Arcelia to use PEP 8 style, um, just because Otherwise you can, like, what are the guidelines that you're following? Um, some people then will start merging their own different um, styles into it. And, and then the whole purpose becomes a bit lost maybe. So if possible, I would prefer everyone to agree on to following a specific set of guidelines and just try to adhere to this. Even though if it's someone that has been developing code for very long in a certain manner, that can be difficult to change or, but yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's very interesting and, and it happens a lot that people just contribute in their own manner and yeah. Maybe if I can quickly follow up on that. So I don't code a lot myself, but I would assume that um, for people who code a certain way, it is muscle memory, right? So from experience, is it very hard to change style, even like small stuff? Um, would that be like a deterrent to contribute? I guess it depends on how motivated you are. I think it's difficult to change your style once you are used to it. Uh, 
like in my case, uh, I learned coding mostly through working at Ercilia. So my code is very consistent with what has been happening at Ercilia, right? But for some external contributors, it's really, really different. And you can really identify which code has been written by who. Uh, so it's very, I think it's it's challenging to, so uh, the best is if you are, is for people that is starting to just pick a guideline that is broadly used, stick to that. And that will be probably what is best when they contribute to, to new projects. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, I see in the chat that, yeah, it's easy to, to recognize when you know, no, like people's contributions by their style. Um, there is a, another question. Um, should I go ahead from the chat? Yes, yes, lovely. Uh, I think, Kevin, we should probably move on um, so that um, our other speakers get a chance to talk sure. too. I, even though I think everyone's really enjoying the questions. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer in the chat. Thank you, Gemma. Perfect. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so next we will have Graciel. Um, yeah, she's there. And she's going to be speaking about code review. And I think your presentation is in, uh, no, it's not in the, yet in the pad, but, um, but will you be able to, to add it later? Um, I was actually planning on just showing a couple of web pages, not a presentation. Perfect. I yeah, that is going to stay recorded. So yeah, perfect. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? OK, <laughs> great. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I will talk a little bit about code review, which is something that I've been doing quite a bit lately. Um, so I wanted to build on what Gemma was talking about. And a lot of what she said was I was relating to how it's useful for code review. So for example, if you put, as she's uh, showing the Python style, you put the code, the the packages in different lines. It's easier for you to review and check for spellings and to see um, if a package is really needed and things like that. Um, so a lot of style guides and style guidelines are related to code review. So they are meant to you to kind of spot errors more easily. Um, so, for example, when you break your code in, in smaller chunks of characters, it's easier for you to spot the blocks of code that need to run correctly. Um, so code review is a process that it's usually done with a colleague, not by yourself, because it's easy it, when you are writing the code that you miss things. Um, so it's important to have a different pair of eyes looking at your code. Um, it's different than of it's different from testing because testing is more uh, checking if your code is working, if the functions are doing the outputs that they meant to do, and the reviewer will be more focused on, for example, documentation and comments, and if your code is good enough, if they can be improved in performance things like that. So um, in the review process, you open up your code for partners, for collaborators to check your code more than um, in, more than just if they are functioning or not, but if they are uh, friendly for other p people and if they are welcoming and if they have instructions for other people to contribute and things like that. So more documentation, comments, and efficiency. Um, so I'd like to show, um, so I've been editing for the Journal of Open Source Software uh, Journal, <laughs> um, and they have really good uh, checklists for code review that it's really, I found it really useful for me. Uh, so I'll share the screen just to show you there. Can you see the web page? Yes, perfect. Uh, so here it's open for everyone to see. It, I think it's really useful when you're reviewing your own code, when you're inviting people to review your code. Uh, so they have these review items. 
so for example, you check if your repository have a so has a software license, if it's um, if it aligned with the software goals and things like that. Um, this is more specific. So documentation, if it, if the repository has a readme, if they have contributing guidelines, if they have a style guide links in the readme, for example. Um, and also installation instructions. This is really important. I've been trying to manage a couple of reviews where the installation instructions are not super explicit. So users have difficulties um, installing and running examples. Um, and examples for usage and API documentation, those are really important when you are running the first the first test when you first install a package and want to see how it works it's really important that you have working examples on your documentation and the data that you are using on your examples are available um, and also things like community guidelines how you expect contributors to behave mm -hmm. when they are collaborating with you and your project um, and also things like functionality, like if like the testing that Gemma was talking about. So if the code is working, if everything is working as expected, if the tests pass in different uh, operational systems, in different uh, environments, because sometimes we have incompatibilities with packages that I think how is talking about that later. Um, so testing those things in different systems are important, and then you you can give feedback saying, hey, uh, everything is working perfectly, but there is a package dependency that you missed here and there. So please make a note or write the documentation or you make a contribution in that sense. Um, and then there are other considerations like authorship, uh, as I said, license, um, and so on and so forth. I think they have, uh, there's a checklist here that you can reuse and try to implement in your own project. So every time you have a code or you have a project and you want to invite people to review your code, sometimes they don't know where to start. I think uh, a suggestion would be to send them this link and ask them to check everything, see if everything is fine in your project, especially documentation. Um, and comments on your code because the code needs to be more than computer readable, they have to be human readable too. So people can understand your decisions in the, in every uh, code line. Um, so I wanted to, so this is the paper that I'm handling right now. They have this checklist in the review process. Uh, so here the reviewers will check each box of, of the things that I just mentioned. So code of conduct, uh, so general, checks for the project, they check for func functionality, documentation. So they go through all these items and give feedback to the author here in the issue thread. I think this is really cool, so that I wanted to show. <laughs> um, and an example of, of my own project that I'm dealing with recently. So we have, let me show, a lot of pull requests. <laughs> so we write code, we write the text, and we ask the collaborators to review the things that we did. So for example, um, this thing here. So this is what this was a development that one contributor did to the code. So they have all these commits on the history of the development of the code. And they did a pull request, which triggered a review process for us. So we could, for example, see the files that was we needed to change in this code development. And here we can, for example, add comments in specific lines of the code. And then we can start a review and then start a conversation and develop together these part of, parts of the code. Um, and this is supposed to improve and to double check things that are not working super right and everything gets documented in the history of our project. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, 
and we use that a lot and we start conversations locally in the code so it's easier for us to spot exactly what we are talking about um those are the coolest things that i had to share are there any questions so far let me see in the chat <laughs> yes uh, more emojis <laughs> No questions? Okay. Yeah, um, so those are mostly my uh, things that I wanted to suggest for you to do. So in the workflow, basically make sure your code, your project is well documented and you have contributing guidelines so people can uh, check your repository, your project, and know how they can review your code and how they can contribute. If they spot a bug, if they spot um, something that can be improved, how they can uh, get in touch with you, or uh, even if they can contribute and make improvements. Yes, Gemma? Thank you, Gracia. I have a very interesting, um, I, I reviewed all these guidelines, but I, I should go back to them again. I have a question that you mentioned briefly about the what is uh, so when we cite our software, what do you consider uh, author like a, con a contribution or not? Um, I don't know if you have some details or examples on that. Um, I, for my experience, it varies a lot. Like um, since I'm not like a computer scientist or anything, I'm an ecologist. Uh, so in my projects, we always have this conversation early on and we try to track, for example, on the GitHub repository, who has contributed to what. And then sometimes we decide the authorship of a paper, for example, based on that. Um, but mainly everyone that contributes, uh, that uh, reveals something and uh, opens an issue, discuss the core things or they contribute with code or you know if it's tracked on the github repository we consider contributor pretty much thank you any further questions comments And also you can add it in the pad or in the chat, no need to speak, you don't want to. We can also leave a few minutes later on or if you can think of uh, other questions because yeah, I don't know, probably people take some time to process the information. I think that's it then. <laughs> um you have any other questions later or comments, feel free to reach out. I'm around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, applause or emojis. <laughs> Talking about emojis. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, what are we going to do now? Uh, so Kevin, uh, back to you, sorry. I'm going to do the um, breakout rooms. But you can you can explain what is happening. So now we are heading to we are heading out to breakout session. So in this now we're going to break out into different rooms uh, for eight minutes breakout, and that will be about three to four rooms. And in this, what we are going to do look at is uh, we are going to look at we provided a link of repositories that we are going to look at the codes to review the codes that are not that are not written by anyone in this group right now so if you check at the other part you can see the links for the GitHubs. so in our breakout rooms we are going to review those codes have a discussion and then come back
All right, you can choose. I'm going to open the rooms and you can choose where to go. I created five. Sounds good? Okay. If you need help to be assigned to a room, do let us know. Uh, I need to be assigned. This is Dario speaking. This is Dario. Uh, where, where can I go? Ah. Uh. Um so I've just okay. sent you to a written right, one. right. Okay. <laughs> Andrea, are you good? I'm thinking which room to go to still. <laughs> challenges, challenges. Thank you for spotting that pass. We're back to recording. Um, so I, we need to move on to our next speaker. I hope you had some interesting time wading through someone else's code and maybe understanding why code style can be important um, and why using guidelines can be important from that. Um, I just quickly wanted to check if anyone had any one quick, quick reflection from the experience that you might like to share. And that can be written or that can be um, spoken. Either is fine. I can share it, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were evaluating the BioPython repository and we found a lot of cool stuff. So they have like a, an issue template. So if you report a bug, they have already a template that you can fill in that's super cool. Um, they have a lot of documentation, um, some interesting comments in the code, but not a lot. And we were wondering a lot about the tests that they run in the repository because we no, they have to run this test and they explain a little bit in the contributing guidelines, but they don't explain what this test do. So we were like wondering why they failed or why they not they didn't fail. Thanks, Graciele. Um, and we have a few comments from the chat as well. It can take a lot of time and effort to dig into another person or group's project. I agree. Uh, experienced software engineers dig into other people's code. Newer people usually prefer to write their own because actually it's easier than dealing with someone else's code. Um, and reviewing code is hard. Um, I felt like I was underqualified for this. Yeah, it is definitely hard, um, <laughs> and especially in an unfamiliar language. Agreed, agreed. Um, I would yeah. love to talk about this longer, but we need to give Hal some time to talk. Um, and who's introducing Hal? It's not me. <laughs> uh, Kevin, Kevin, are you here and is your internet being good? I'm going to, yes, oh, yes, yes you are. Yeah. Over to you. Uh, for a managing health session, take it away. Yeah, so what is just a minute? Okay. Okay. So, so our next session is about package management. So, so our speaker for this is uh, how he, I think, is that the right pronunciation? Just repeat. 
So how is a reproducibility librarian at the University of Florida? So how can you take it on from here? Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I used the, the OLS template slides. Uh, the link is in the, um, the etherpad. So you're welcome to uh, use, view the slides, reuse the slides. Um, they're all uh, available uh, CC by. Um, so yes, uh, I'm the reproducibility librarian at the University of Florida. Um, I'm gonna cover, I think, kind of similar topics that Graciel and Emma uh, have already reviewed, but maybe a little bit uh, bigger picture about um, interacting in the open source software ecosystem. Uh, and yeah, I am the reproducibility librarian at the University of Florida. Uh, if you have questions about this topic or reproducibility or anything, uh, really, uh, you're welcome to email me. My contact information is in these slides. So I think the big part about open source software to me uh, and my motivation for being involved in it uh, is that it is participatory. Um, when you are using open source software, um, you know you can use it just as you would any other piece of software. But because it is open source, you can also uh, change it if you need to make some changes that work better for you. Uh, or you can even uh, provide uh, new features or fixes if there are issues in software that someone else has written. And I think that's important uh, and relates to kind of the values of what open life science uh, and open leadership of, is about, um, which is, you know, this idea that we have projects that are really about empowering others um, to collaborate within inclusive communities. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that operates and how those principles translate in writing open source software. Uh, so I'm borrowing this uh, framework from the CSCCE community participation model. Um, which has a spectrum of kind of different levels at which uh, people may interact in your community, um, ranging from, you know, conveying and consuming uh, your, your outputs or your information uh, and going all the way to co-creation. So some of the ways that these different levels uh, might show up in the open source software space. Um, if you are downloading and using open source software, um, maybe you're only participating at the level of conveying and consuming the outputs. Uh, maybe as you kind of get more involved with a particular piece of software or a particular community, you might provide information to others about how to use that software. So maybe you um, write a blog post about it or provide tutorials for others, uh, or maybe you add issues or suggestions for new features to the original creators of that software. Maybe uh, as you get more comfortable in your programming skill or your familiarity with uh, the software, or you have time to make more uh, detailed contributions, uh, you can collaborate and, and create pull requests to contribute that code or documentation directly to an open source project. And then maybe, you know, as you get more involved with the people and the communities, uh, you might co-develop new software with uh, other people in that community, or you work with the community to develop community standards, or be otherwise kind of deeply, more deeply involved with uh, everyone else in the open source world. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to go through some kind of general recommended practices for engaging in open source software. Uh, so some of this, again, is going to touch upon practices that you've already heard about um, in testing and code style and code review. And so I think I, I kind of put three main bullet points here. Uh, first, identify your project's unique role in the ecosystem. Uh, add effective metadata to your open source software project. Um, and then three, to follow community standards. So uh, for the unique value proposition, um, 
you know, what, what role is your project playing? Um, you know, I think if you, you've already kind of experimented with the open canvas um, and kind of describing that aspect of your, of your project, um, you've already kind of described in some ways what your project is bringing uh, that is new or unique. Um, and I think it's important to think about for, for open source software um, in working together with other people. Sometimes we also have to ask ourselves the hard question, is it better to create something new uh, or is it really more useful for the community if we extend or update an existing project? Um, so that we don't get into kind of this situation uh, as outlined in this XKCD comic of thinking that we need to create additional standards that are the best thing uh, and then resulting in many, many different pieces of software that do very similar tasks. Uh, the second recommended practice is writing effective metadata. So some of these you've already seen, uh, I think in the discussed in the OLS uh, syllabus. So the README, making sure you have a very good description of what your project does and its role. Uh, I have my own resources on README that I've linked here. There is a contributing document that is important for identifying how other people can contribute uh, code or documentation or other things to your project and how you expect people to interact in the community uh, and following a code of conduct, for example. A license that describes how people can use and reuse the code from your project in their own work. Um, there is a listing of uh, licenses um, that are open source, uh, and I put that link here. And of course, you've probably already gone through the, the lesson about choosing a license, so I won't go through that in more detail. Uh, and then attributions. Um, so, you know, I think we, we, we touched upon that a little bit with kind of identifying authorship for open source software to really kind of solve that problem and make and formalize a common solution. Uh, it's now recommended that you create a CFF file that is the citation file format um, that that acknowledges contributors to your open source project and is an indication for how to cite your software. Um, and so that is a kind of joint project that other um, that many groups have agreed upon as a standard for acknowledging contributors. Um, and I'll refer you to the, the GitHub website that has more details about it, uh, as well as uh, links to automated tools for generating CFF files from other sorts of metadata in your project, uh, and maybe from, you know, like the history of contributors to your GitHub. Uh, and then the third part about open source software is community standards. So uh, I think Graciel mentioned the, the JOS um, uh, review protocols. Uh, those are for reviewing submissions for uh, the Journal of Open Source Software. Um, other communities also have standards and guides for contributing open source projects. Uh, so I linked here um, some examples from the R OpenSci community and the Pi OpenSci community. Um, and those have details about kind of the expected uh, standards and expected practices for open source software uh, that might be relevant for you if you are creating open source software for those communities. Uh, some of those common features that you might see in those development guides, uh, things you we've already talked about, style guides and naming recommendations for your code, uh, making sure to do documentation of your functions um, and tutorials and vignettes for how to use the software, tests, code coverage, and continuous integration, and then other general good practices uh, like making sure your code is modular uh, and is based around simple functions that can work together. Uh, so yeah, we talked about unit tests already, you know, tests that check for correct functionality of the code. Um, one plug I wanted to, to mention uh, is in relation to you to writing tests for your code uh, is really looking into continuous integration, um, which is a way to kind of run your tests on your software automatically um, on every push or pull request to your uh, GitHub repository uh, or other repository. Um, and that's now a lot easier with GitHub Actions. Um, so once you get involved in writing tests, 
and running tests on your software. Um, you know, that can be a tedious thing to do to like test your software every time you make changes. Uh, but doing tedious, repetitive tasks is exactly what computers are best at. Uh, and so we can use uh, automation to do that task for us. And then an additional point about uh, testing your software is there is um, uh, there is also a, a kind of very loose metric for checking how how complete your tests are. Uh, that's called code coverage. Um, and what that does is it, it looks at how many lines in your code are actually run as a result of going through your test suite. Um, and so it's a way to kind of look at are there key features of your software that are being tested? Um, and if they are not, making sure that you write tests to cover those, those key functions. Uh, and there's a kind of wide range in, in acceptability uh, for how much code coverage you need. You don't need 100%. Um, and usually 50 to 90% is a kind of a common range for what people identify as this is code, this is a piece of software that has been uh, well tested on this kind of meeting community standards. And then I have a, a link here for some information about, about writing, uh, writing better tests, because test code is usually a bit different than writing uh, other kinds of code. Okay, uh, so that's kind of it for, for my topics. Uh, I'll look through the questions that we have now in the chat and the etherpad. Oh, Yo is sh sharing the story about um, my 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 problem, my my encounter with uh, automation and um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you all have any questions about kind of engaging with uh, the open source uh, software community um, and writing software packages, uh, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rao, for that. So, questions? There is one that uh, Gemma sent, but to, only to me, because we were, we were chatting about something else. So I'm going to, can you post it um, like again for everyone else, Gemma? Gemma if oh, you're there. I, can, I can do it, but that was more of a feedback for the organizers than a common question. Um, ah, OK. Oh, sorry. I, <laughs> OK, I can make the comment in general. Um, it was just that. I think, um, yeah, the, it was a great talk, how many things, and then maybe the first part should just focus on code style and no testing, um, to avoid overlap and to give discussion. I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy it in the pad, is that all right? At the end? Mm. Any, any questions or comments, um, anything at all? How do we do, are we doing with time? Uh, short as always, <laughs> can we extend the hours in the day? I'm the only one who thinks that is not enough really, probably not. If, if we do, we would just fill it with even more stuff. I, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Yes, if there are no questions about how, then I'm gonna try and do the the wrapping up. Um so thank you. Thank you very much to our three wonderful speakers. Um uh, thanks for uh volunteering to um do this trial session um with us uh for those in for the mentees in the uh, cohort just uh, like reminder that you still like you know 
getting towards the end of this cohort already. Um, you still have like time to invite experts, um, anyone from the OLS team. Um, Pass kindly has posted the midterm survey in um, the closing section of the etherpad. So if you haven't um, fed back uh, on that yet, you can still fill that out. And um, in terms of next calls, next week, uh, the code call will be on diversity, uh, inclusion, and ally skills, um, which is a really cool topic. So I hope you join us um, for that. Um, and um, then the one other one left for this year is on personal ecology, which is also always a, a good one to reflect before you go into a break. Um, for this session, um, as we've just mentioned, like there's feedback at the bottom. Please do leave your thoughts about um, how to restructure things, how to group topics, topics differently. Um, this session is kind of based on what was what if um, put in when the OLS team crowdsourced ideas for um, what should be covered in an open uh, source software session. And then you have me who can't really write code who try to put it together. And if there are better ways to cluster things for next time, please let me let me know because like I think I pushed things back and forth a few times figuring out how things fit best. Um, so um please do leave leave feedback on um yeah what we could do um differently next time. I do think this will become like a, a regular thing in the cohorts if we can make it work. So um uh let let us know what uh you would like to see differently um next time where we can improve uh any any feedback is welcome um but again thank you to uh Gemma, Gemma, Graziele and how for being speakers for this first time round they didn't have very much to go on because I very very much was like you know this is like this is our first trial um, let's see what happens. Um, so thank you very much for volunteering for that. Thank you everyone for um, the time here with us at uh, your past. Have I forgotten any housekeeping? No, you didn't forget, but I want to add that I made a mistake and I sent in the last email. I just realized now um, in the last uh, CV email uh, to the all six people, I sent the survey uh, from all as uh, five, the midterm survey, but it's not too bad because because it's not anonymous. So I, even if it was anonymous, I have the dates people completed. So three people uh, completed that one this week. So uh, I'm gonna send you another email with the right link to the the survey. I'm gonna post it on the Slack as well. Sorry about that, but no worries. For those who completed the the link, is totally fine. I'm gonna just transfer it to the other to the other survey. Are we all set free? Beautiful. Have a lovely evening, day, etc. Everyone. Thank you, Gavin. It's been lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. That dog is so cute. Better than mine. <laughs>